What we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about insurance, bad faith, insurance itself. Um, I realized in putting this program together, I've done this before, this some similar program before. I've realized that this is truly like a six to eight hour seminar. It could be because it's such a deep subject. I have done probably, probably as many um, insurance bad faith property cases, bad faith trials, um, than anybody in California at this point, or as many as at least anybody. Um, and I've tried other types of bad faith cases too, but I like bad faith, I like insurance. I know that makes me a little bit of a geek, but it's really interesting subject. I think it's interesting, I think it's nuanced. I also think that my good friend Jeff Ellis is sitting here tonight um, making me a little uncomfortable because he's one of the finest coverage lawyers I know. And it is, um, it is a manageable subject, but to most lawyers who don't do this on a regular basis, it's sort of like Martian. It's very foreign in a lot of respects, and I don't think it is that difficult to master. So, of course, first we have contract damages, and that's kind of basic. And in, in order to uh, prove that, you need uh, breach, and um, you need damages, of course, which are the contract remedies. That and it, let me make this drill this home to you, though. If you do not have a valid breach of contract in some way, in some form, you will never get to a bad faith case. You must have a breach of contract. So as bad as you think the insurance company might act, as their behavior might be, you have to find that there's some kind of breach. Now, breach can happen in three important ways. The easiest and the best is they've wrongfully denied coverage. We didn't put the word wrongfully in there, but they've wrongfully denied coverage. So there is coverage and they denied it. The reason I like that case the best is because it underlines the fact that the insurance company has stiffed you. The, the insured is sitting there having a claim that's unpaid. They haven't had been compensated. So they've been stiffed. The second one is they pay something, but they don't pay all of it. So now you're fighting over really what's owed, how much is owed. They think they paid enough. You don't think you've paid enough. Not a bad case. The most difficult case you're going to find is a case where the insured's paid. They've paid. Maybe there's a delay. You're arguing over delay, but they've paid the claim. And those are the cases that I would red flag because if you come, if the case like that comes in and says, I've got a problem, we're going to talk about this under, with underinsured and uninsured motorists a little bit later. But if an insured comes in with that situation and they say that they've been fully paid, you need to think long and hard about whether or not you want that case because now you're trying to argue about additional damages, what happened to the person as a result of that. Bad faith in general, and going back to what Brian said, the contract, you need the breach, that's a threshold requirement. No matter how bad the conduct is, if, if you ultimately aren't going to be able to prove breach, you can't get to bad faith. So bad faith is when they've acted unreasonably and without proper cause. That's, again, after you pass the question of did they breach the contract, did they not comply with what the policy requires for them to, uh, for them to do. Um, and also, a lot of people are mistaken about this. It's not a fiduciary relationship, relationship, so you are not the paramount thing that they need to consider when making their decisions. However, they have to give you kind of equal footing or equal consideration. So it's kind of, it's a delicate balance there. It's not a fiduciary relationship, but they do have to give you equal consideration. A key question that we're going to keep going back to over and over again throughout this presentation is going to be unreasonable, whether or not right. they're so, acting reasonably. So, but let's focus on this for just one more moment. It is not your typical contract. In your typical contract, you do not have to give equal consideration to the other party as you give to yourself. In an insurance situation, you do. And one thing I, I use in opening statement in a jury uh, with juries is I explain that the uniqueness of an insurance relationship is unlike any other contract because unlike any other contract, you can't replace the contract once an event has occurred. So the house is burned down. You can't go out and find insurance to insure you after your house is burned down. So the insurance company has to put themselves on the same level with you. They can't put their interests ahead of yours. A lot of people think it's a fiduciary relationship. It's not. But ultimately, you can go to the next slide. It's okay. But ultimately, it's whether or not, the question for bad faith is whether or not the insurance company acted reasonably. It's not negligence. It's not, it's not fraud standard, but it's not negligence. So merely getting it wrong isn't enough. It has to be whether or not the insurance company acted unreasonable. So a threshold question I think Brian um, has instilled in me to look at before we you know, take on a case or not is, is the plaintiff likable? Like all the other threshold questions about what, is there a breach? 
equally important is, is the plaintiff likable? Is the jury going to hate your plaintiff? Because ultimately, at the end of the day, what you're pursuing is not a claim against the party that caused the harm or did the wrong. You're pursuing an insurance company, especially in a third party case. You're going after the other side's insurance company. You're not going after the person that crashed into you or the person that caused whatever injury your client is suffering from. So you have to make sure that your client is likable enough where they're not going to look at it and go, well, he's a jerk, and, and it's not like they're suing the person that hurt him. They're just suing this, this company, this kind of faceless entity. So you got to make sure that that's the first question you look at. This is popping the lid off a of policy, which is something that a lot of plaintiff lawyers, particularly personal injury plaintiff lawyers, are constantly talking about. And one of the seminars we want to give in the future would be much more in-depth about this. It would be sort of the topic is how do you turn a – um, huge damage but small policy limits case into a, a valuable case. And this is one of the ways. This is where you've got someone who's got injuries that exceed the amount of um, uh, the policy limits. You've got small policy limits. And you want to make a demand under the policy for um, the policy limits and hope that the insurance company doesn't pay. Because if they don't pay, the general rule is they can be liable for the entire damage. But like every case and every, every uh, um, situation we face as lawyers, there's all kinds of exceptions. So let's kind of go through this. What we're trying to come up with here is you've got this client that comes into your office. They've got fairly significant injuries. The client in, was hit by someone who has a $15,000 or $25,000 policy. And um, you know in your mind that the, the case is worth at least that, if not much more. Uh, so what are you going to do? Well, the first thing you need to do is make sure that you've got the amount of policy limits. And carriers generally have no obligation to give the limits outside of discovery. Sometimes they will. Sometimes the insured will tell you how much insurance they have. But once you know that you've got, if you're in litigation, they have to provide confirmation. Once you know what the policy limits are, or you have to have a reasonable belief in what they are, because you could be sued by your client if you make a $15,000 demand and the client had a hundred, and the uh, the other driver had a $100,000 policy, for example.